cone six, which we have a thunderstorm going on in the background. So, <laughs> no, but, but um, I was doing cone six white stone work and a lot of these textural surfaces were painted in, in pale greens or pale um, sienna's uh, kind of a burnt orange. Um, and then uh, about um, 10 years ago, maybe 15, I was invited to go down to a, a women's wood firing down in Southern Oregon. And um, I just enjoyed working with a women's wood firing down in Southern Oregon. And um, I just enjoyed working with groups of people so much because I've always worked alone. And in Eastern Washington, I really work, worked alone back then. I was the only one that was heading over to the coast and working, uh, doing festivals. And um, so it was so nice to have, to actually find a family of people that I could commune with. So I started doing the wood firings and this would, this, this picture would be more typical of a wood fired surface. Um, although it's a little heavy, and this is sort of what I'm going to show you t today is just this simple uh, picture form. Um, if Ken asks me back, I'll build a teapot. <laughs> All right. um, but this, this is wood fired. Did we lose her, Ken? We, uh, she froze up. There she is. This, this is a soda, recent, very recent soda fired one. This is um, wheel thrown, one piece wheel thrown, another piece wheel thrown, and then a slab built spout. Um, rolled in textures on this would be corrugated cardboard, these are, I'll sh demonstrate this today, how I um, create some of this hand carving. It's a lot like if you are familiar with repose, this is, this is like that in that I push from the inside out and then on the outside I push it back in. So it's a, a jewelry term of, of repose. And then um, in the soda firing process then I'm still limited to the colors that I can use but I, it can end up getting sort of this nice um, grayish black and the rust tones and, and my composition tends to be more important. Um, I set, a side note to, to my work is that for 20 years I taught uh, art at Gonzaga University. I'm now retired and I always taught drawing or design, never ceramics. And um, I think that comes out in my work a little bit compositionally. So, um, so there are questions. A picture. Yes. <laughs> uh oh, you froze up on us. Some, well, some plastic bins like this, they have plaster repairs in the bottom of them. There's like small wet boxes. And in them, I can keep pieces and parts that I have thrown. So like I left on um, Sunday, and I was able to put the, everything that I wanted to make for you guys inside one of these, and, and it is exactly the way I left it. Awesome. Um, uh, four days ago. So, for example, certified. What does it mean by certified? Did I use the word certified? I don't remember. 
No, I don't recall. No, it's not. I know Wait. certified, but certified by what? Soda fired. Oh. Soda, soda fired. <laughs> there we go. I got that. Soda fired. Yes. Soda fired. Yes. Okay, okay. So soda <laughs> fired, if you can see behind me, there's a big kiln uh -huh. back there. <clears throat> and okay. we put the work into that kiln, about three of us, it takes to fill it. And we fired up to high temp. Yeah. And then when we reach cone nine, usually, we introduce soda, salt. In this case, I use baking soda uh -huh. and uh, soda ash, a mixture of that. And we insert it into the kiln and through using, in this case, bamboo rods. We lost your sound again. The soda reacts with the silica and then the clay. And it lands the pots and creates the shiny surfaces. Gina? We yes. lost you for a minute. I was trying to fill in a little bit, but go ahead. Oh. Uh, just kind of reiterate the, how the soda reacts with the with the clay or silica. The soda, um, I use a mixture of soda ash and baking soda mixed with whiting into kind of a paste, and I put it on bamboo rods, half so they're they're like half open and. I insert them into an opening on each side of the kiln at cone nine, and it, it, um, I'm trying to explain what it does. It literally, there's a word, it, say it again, Ken. Vo volatilize. Volatilizes, or it, um, it, it's like it fumes. It, it, the, the heat, the high heat in the kiln just takes that product and and just and it travels then through the kiln based upon the flame current because the flame is coming in and then it has to travel up and around and then back down and then out the chimney so the soda then travels that same path and as it travels it lands on the surfaces of the pottery and it creates a, a shine. Um, true soda creates kind of an orange peel surface. Um, soda ash and uh, baking soda creates more of a, sh a little shinier surface. So we do a, we do some things to the process to make it not shiny towards the very end of the firing, but it's it's a long conversation. <laughs> I think you'd rather watch me build something. Yes, I see. Yes, I, and like I said, I do have uh, images of the soda firing process on my kiln, on my website. Okay. Under my kiln. Mm. Okay. Okay, yeah. oh well, check right. it out. And then, um, so anyway, these, I rolled out this slab on uh, Sunday. I don't have a lot of equipment in my studio. I don't have a slab roller. I have a potter's wheel. Um, my whole life, I have worked very simply with very few, um, very few tools. I know no extruders. Um, I'm just comfortable with uh, the um, rolling pin, and I had went to a wonderful demonstration early on in my studio by Margaret Ford, and watched her work with slabs and it changed my life. I, it was uh, the way she talked about a slab and how she worked with them. And uh, I've never needed all of the big, um, all those things that are available. <laughs> While we're on hold, my slab roller is a giant catch-all. It's a table, I use it very seldom. Very expensive table. Hmm? There, now you're back. <laughs> How, you keep losing me, huh? Yeah, you're freezing. We weren't having that problem before. 
uh, when we did the test. You were coming through very well. But I'm worried right. that it's this thunderstorm ah. that we're having here. So did you lose me again? You, you freeze up. Yeah, you're freezing up. Yeah, we do not. What, what website, what uh, internet do you have me hooked up to? Um, all I can think of is it's this thunderstorm that we're having right now. Yeah. Or a lot of are people you, on. We'll, are just you, go, we'll just go ahead and, and uh, we'll and deal with Bill, it. I'll make sure that people are talking about that. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. I'm going to build. I'm thinking that it's the thunderstorm. Did you hear that? Yeah. Oh, I hear you fine. Yes. Okay. I have no idea if it's a thunderstorm or not. Okay. Well, then we're just going to try and I'm going to demonstrate. Go so for I, have it. All, I have all different stages here. Okay. So I have a tendency to either work with a slab um, two ways where I hand carve into it or I roll the textures into it. So um, and I don't really work with templates. I've never worked with templates. I really let the slab kind of decide for me what shape the piece is going to be. And um, so um, I'm going to go like that. And like that. And then I can put these back in this bin to keep it nice. And then I have played with over the years um, a lot of textures. This is laser cut, a laser cut surface um, of a black and white photograph of daylilies or grasses. Okay. And um, luckily my kids worked in a school much like DigiPen and I had access to some of these wonderful uh, big machines that would, that could cut this. I've played with this kind of surface and I've played with when the kids at school would cut out pieces and parts for some of their machines, I would save some of those surfaces and I can roll clay into those also. So I'm gonna play with this one, I think, because I have the other one to show you here in a minute. Okay. Oh, I've even lost Ken, I'm losing people. No, you're there. Oh, okay, I just can't see you guys. Okay. Hi, Gina. We just turned off the cameras so that you're not sure. We can oh. see you much better. Okay. Sounds good. Oh, good. So we had someone solve the problem for us. I'm so glad Ray's here to do that because no one else could do it. No, I, I take no credit. It was Susan whose idea. <laughs> oh, Susan. You're awesome. Okay. So I'm going to play with this one this way, just to sort of show you what it can do. I have to be careful not to go real deep because it will um, then break when I want to put it together. What is the material? Is that like foam core? Or? This is just a thin um, MDO. Oh, okay. MDF. Yeah. MDF board. Okay. Laser cut. So some student used these parts that are missing for some machine they were building and then they tossed this piece out and I would walk through and find their rejects. Awesome. <laughs> and put them 
put them to good use. So that's the surface that I got from that. Yeah, nice. And then um, if I then use this for a pitcher, this would probably be a very tall. Oh yeah, this is gonna be fun. <laughs> okay, see, I'm letting the slab dictate the shape that this is going to be, which is is really to me quite fun. There's a, a wonderful comment that sometimes the clay, sometimes I control the clay, and sometimes the clay controls me. And um, I've always liked the concept of of letting the clay dictate some of my my decisions more than um, me telling it what to do, which is another reason why I never get, I'm never good at um, doing commission pieces. <laughs> <laughs> I want, they want a piece exactly like, like what uh, they saw before and I've never been able to do that. Um, so, There's a little tiny bit of cracking. I try and make really work the the slab really well. Okay. I used to, I've used over the years lots of different um, mediums for putting slabs together. I basically just use my throwing water um, at this point. Okay. Uh, we talked about attachments last week, so I in, was interested as to what you were using. I've used a uh, thick slurry with a little bit of silica gel in it to sort of almost make like a casting, you know, casting slip. Mm -hmm. And I and if for a while there, I used a mix that Martha Grover uh, did for a, a lecture, which used toilet paper in it, oh, like okay. a paper clay. Uh -huh. And I... I just I've done that for repairs. I I've used it for repairs, but I didn't like it for for um joints yeah, at joint. all. Yeah. Well you work with very wet slabs, so you, you have work, that going for you. I do work with a pretty soft slab. Um but I might have so much fun with this little picture. I might not move on to the final one, but we're going to. So I would paddle this seam. And I'll come back to this, this teapot, this picture. That kind of has a fun, a fun teapot sh or pitcher shape already without doing a lot to it. Okay, then it needs a foot. I do have this fun <clears throat> little point right here that I would have a tendency to want to do something with that, maintain it in some way, but it might disappear. I also come in on the inside of these things whenever I make a seam like this and I work it. But a lot of time, I might wait to work that for a little while, not right up. If I can reach it, if I know I can reach it later, I might work it a little bit later after it's had some time to set up. Mm -hmm. Okay. And get a little stronger and stiffer. Okay, so I'm going to put a... Can you turn that so that the joint faces us? I was noticing that uh, how beautiful the uh, the joint is. The line is really reflects the form of the uh, of the piece, so... Really yeah, I'm probably going to play with... Um, I have a tendency to play with some of this stuff I've... 
added to with so I'm doing that where I'm pushing out from the inside and pushing it out to sort of create some. And, and I have no, I had no preconceived idea of what this what it wanted to do. So now I have a little bit of movement even on the, um, even on the sides because I've played with this texture that I used. As artists, we find it hard to talk and build. It's oh, I do, absolutely, <laughs> I, I get it. So I'll lose, I'll lose track of what I was gonna say about, as I'm thinking about what my next step is gonna be. So today, I might, tonight, I might not work on that scene, uh, on the inside, but know that I will, okay? Because uh, that seam has to be, um, I did score and slip, but it needs to, um, it doesn't have to be coiled, but I might come in with a tool like this and 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 work the inside of that, that seam. For, especially since it's a pitcher, I want the inside to be as, even though we might not in this case see that much of it, but I want that inside seam not to be that noticeable on the inside. Um, I keep a real gentle hand on the outside too, so that um, I'm, I'm not impacting the surface of, that I've worked to put into it, this detail. Yeah, I'm going to put a foot on that. And this is pretty straightforward slab building. Um, I've played with, with a lot of different types of feet over the years. I think, you know what they say, everything has a foot, a body, and a mouth. Um, and I think in, in most cases, I like to, I like the foot to, to separate the body of the pot from the surface it's sitting on. I've never liked this, the piece to sit, what I say, sit heavy. So just, yes, I want it to feel like it wants to, there's maybe it casts a little shadow on the bottom or, um, so that it it sits light it doesn't you can you can see a line so important I've got a variety of scoring tools that I've collected over the years. Um, of course, everybody knows this one, which you keep losing these things and then you find them in your clay when you're wheel throwing. Yeah, not good. <laughs> I don't like those. But these are um, weaving tools. These wow. Tools. And this is a printmaking tool from China. And I've lost all of the teeth on it now, except these five from <laughs> having, it drop, having it drop on the floor. But when it was full, this was my prized possession. It's a piece of bone. 
And I think in the printmaking world, they would do in mono printing, they would make lines and stuff with, with this. So. Simple little slab foot. So see this slab is soft, but it's not so soft that I can't well, yeah, it has some structure now. Yeah, it has some strength. There's a lot of things I do. Um, loose to begin with and then I come back in a couple days or usually the next day and fine tune them, uh, fix up the edges or now I'm cutting this base at an angle a beveled a beveled cut because in this case I want to I want to paddle it up around the piece. I'm going to clean that up first. I think people in our sound design uh, school would, would like to record that. That sound right yeah. there. Yeah. Now this was that little spot right there. <laughs> I also like this slab to be pushed upwards into the into the form. Um, I make <laughs> full that it'll keep that slab from cracking because it will then as it dries it will drop down and if it was flat it can only go you can expand on this can if you'd like if it's flat then it will go it 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 has nowhere to to shrink into so it separates but that's why i do it is i've had more success with this being slightly, especially if it's, especially if this is harder than this, which in this case they're the same, but um, you want that that to be there, um, that that hump in the bottom. Okay. Now I've I've d haven't done uh, I haven't finished this foot. It's just too soft. So I would come back to that to this foot and play with it more as <clears throat> and I might decide and I and I'll go over that with the, this other one that I have sort of in progress I might decide to let that line disappear and then maybe put in um, some little some little indentations You know, maybe some something like that to sort of play with the the foot. 
Um, I have some of this is just too soft. To work with the way I'd like to. So if I wanted to get rid of this line, I could, I, you can easily, you can add clay, you can, you can do it, or I could, I could in this, in this particular case, I could clean it up and make it a very specific line. And sometimes those decisions, I don't make them right away. A lot of times I'll let the piece sit and I come back to it the next day. If I can keep it in good order, I'll come back to it the next day and make that decision after I've thought about the piece a little bit. And sometimes, sometimes I need to make that decision based upon what the, um, the what happens everywhere else. So see this, this would be a cleaned up line on the foot. Clean it up. So see, I'll show that one to you a little closer. So see, that could be, that could be more of a finished look where I've accentuated the lines coming into it. And I might even add, um, I might even add a, a little coiled foot, right? something something right there to just because it's not going to sit right flat on the so I might add something like that right there okay and I would score and slip it and I would probably do it much better than that little ball I would grab, I'm disappearing off the camera. Ray? I'm back. <laughs> Let's see. Did I disappear? Just, just briefly. Okay. So I rolled this little coil into this what used to be a shoebox lid, but it's a really thin corrugated cardboard. And then I take that and I shove it down. And that is a much more interesting little foot to put under there then. And I might even, you know, when I try that, I might end up with like two of them, but needed to go right there and I'd score and I would slip it okay so I'm going to set that one aside for a minute and I'm going to come back to I know you want to see it closer to being done but I did this one today um, the other day, and I have it pretty much, this is, this texture here, if you can see it, is this, is this one. Okay. And um, I really like those exaggerated um, spouts that give the pieces elevation. But this is what I was talking about when I said I have a couple of choices on the slab foot. Do I want to do I want to make it so you can't 
see that seam at all. And in this particular case, when I rolled out the texture, I gave myself kind of an inch, kind of a, an existing uh, line that separates the texture from the, the tabletop. And so then my, my first thought was that I would like to really work that slab in so that it, you can't see my addition because that gives me one line here on the foot. If I leave it, if I leave it, then I've got two lines. I've got this one and this one. And this already has so much activity going on that I didn't really feel like I need both lines. So this, this, <laughs> this is, this is probably how I will finish this particular foot is smooth. I'll smooth it out so you can barely, so you can barely see it. Okay. Now, and there's some things that, that uh, when I threw out this slab, it, um, it ends up with some, an opening in, in there. I will patch that from the inside and I'll smooth the seam out from the inside so that you can't see it. And I did this slab exactly the same way as the one you just saw me, me do. Okay. And so I would get this all seamed, all smoothed out. On this one, I did um, put the slab on the bottom like, like this one. But then I took a little coil um, about the size of, of um, a pencil lead. I used to get them, make the coils in here too, way too thick and then I'd end up getting cracking. And I put a coil on that, that seam down here between the slab coming down, straightforward slab building. And, and I work that slab, that, that coil in to that seam really, really well. And smooth it out and make it pretty because it's a picture and you're gonna be able to see into the inside of it and, and you want it to not be a distraction down there. You want it to be all one, one surface. Hi, Gina. So, hmm? Hi, this is Raymond. Yes. Um, I just noticed that Susan actually had a question for you, and I know you're busy focused on the, the, the piece that you're doing, um, but uh, I just wanted oh. to make sure she had a chance to ask you a question. Yes, Susan, um, actually from how far I'm sitting from the computer, I struggle to see these questions. So please do this in the future, let me know. So when I cut that bevel on uh, this piece, the bevel was, I made it, um, should I, pencil, pencil. I wonder if you can see this. Um, So, oh, you can't see that. So the bevel goes like this, okay? And the pot comes down to here, and then I paddled that bevel up. So it's a, the thin part of the bevel gets beveled up, gets paddled up towards onto the side of the pot. And in some cases, if you can't reach into the interior, that, sub, that can substitute for the coil that you would normally add um, because you're actually reinforcing that seam from the outside by doing that. So that the bevels like this, and here's the slab coming down, and then I paddle it onto it. Does that answer the question? Or out or in? Yes, that's exactly what I wanted to know. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Good, okay. Right. But I had another question too, right after that one. About how thick do you roll out your slabs? Uh, they're under a quarter of an inch. Okay. Um, they're, uh, depending upon how big the piece is also, um, this slab here was probably um, in between an eighth and a quarter. This one's a quarter. Okay. Uh, 
Um, and, and, and as I, I have a tendency to like any of these edges that are going to show, I have a tendency to like to keep them thin. Um, also when I'm working on pieces, if I'm afraid they're going to dry out East, over here in Eastern Washington, we, things dry out on us. <laughs> and so I keep these really thin, um, terry cloth, old towels, and I can just get them wet. And I can drape them over a surface like that. And that surface then will stay just perfect. And then the rest of it can sort of set up. And so this one's been, this one was sitting here um, <laughs> all afternoon with, um, with another one around it, which I don't see it anywhere. Wrapped around this top so that when I came in here this evening, I could, I could um, work on this top part with you um, and it would still be nice and soft and pliable. Okay. This, this particular piece on this particular, this, this texture, I have a tendency to really play with this texture and, uh, over the next couple of days. And um, what's kind of fun about a workshop is, is to see a piece at this stage and then I eventually will come in and post the finished piece, say on my website, and then you can see what it looked like after I got it soda fired. But the amount of, um, the amount of work that I do on this, this particular texture is actually not very economically reasonable. <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm looking for my favorite carving tool. I'm like, going, where is it? I have them all setting. Oh, there it is. It's I, this particular little piece was probably one of these, but um, and then I bent it to suit my needs. But I will come in on a piece like this and 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 work with some of these areas and then even see if I can find an area I might come in and even and I'll turn this and show it to you I would might come in and do this also, so see I've carved away right here, and then I've added some uh, linear texture to right there. I don't, I don't do a lot of it, but some of it just to make, just to break it up and not make it so um, expected. And especially if it's a nice line that goes from all the way to the bottom, all the way to the top, I wanna, I wanna define that, like, I wanna define that line so that, it's more, it's more obvious. And then that lets me, that lets, that, this to me is more interesting here now than it was, was before. Okay, so now I'm gonna put a, I'm gonna put a, a spout like this on here. And I could do it two ways. I could throw a plate and then toss it and make it oval which is one way we do it. But I have a tendency to, um, since I hear this is a hand building focus, I thought, well, I'll just do it a different way. I'll just do it the way I normally do, actually, which is a slab. And I'm thinning out this top edge to put it against so that I don't have a fat, a fat, um, I want it, I want it to flow into this pot, not to, to look separate. And so now I've got kind of this nice kind of raggedy little edge that, that I can, can make the, this, this spout form go into, which is more interesting than if it was, um, edge to edge and you can see the edge. 
the edges being so specific. Okay. I'm still on this particular one, don't like how heavy this one sits on the table. And the temptation on this one would be to, for, I'll, I'll think about it. And the temptation would be to, I am all <laughs> what I want to do with this one to make it, so it doesn't sit on the ground so heavy. Um, sometimes I've done something as simple as add a coil, a coil right along here, sort of, sort of set in, so that it does, it literally does sort of lift it just slightly up off the table, the tabletop. Or I've done a coil here on each end that you can see, and then that leaves it open in the middle. Um, but a lot of times these decisions have to happen later, um, as you've had time to think about the piece and, and look at it. And I don't know, I wake up at 3.30 in the morning and I pretty much walk through most of the pieces I'm working on, and that's where I resolve it, in the middle of the night. So, okay, so I'm going to th throw a, a, a spout for this. And I do want to incorporate a little bit of that texture that I'm working with on this, um, this spout that I'm making. And I have kind of a fun way I, I do that. Um, so see, I've sort of, I wedged it out and I'm sort of developing the shape right now. And Gina, when you said you were going to throw a spout, I'm not gonna my, I'm my gonna, mind went to the wheel. <laughs> I'm going to slab build. But okay. I, am, huh? I am going to throw it. <laughs> there you go. Got it. <laughs> well, I am going to throw it. And I am going to roll it. Pretty straightforward. I want it, I want it to be about two thirds or a little, too, I don't want it to be, it can't be too small and it can't, and it can't be too big. So there's there's a magic size in there and it's usually it's usually can you see that please? It's usually um in this case it's gonna be about two thirds the height of the pot. That isn't necessarily always true because you could do it you could do it way down in here. Thank you. And that would be a completely different look. That's not you. <laughs> but I want it to have a more exaggerated bird like spout on it. Okay. Okay. So, because I want this outside section to have some of the same grass-like textures, I have these just, this is um, chipboard is all this is. And I lay it down in any kind of random pattern and lay this over the top of it.
then I want to refine this a little bit. And I, I work this edge in tight, work it. I work it with the sponge on the inside. And I might add a line down the middle. This line might have been too sharp. The fake channel for the okay. Then I'm gonna turn that over. I'm going to work this side. Is there a time limit tonight? Are you still there, Ken? Have I lost everybody? Uh oh. I'm here. Oh, I'm good. here too. <laughs> I'm going, where's Kim? Here too. Have there been any more questions? No. Okay. So you can see that this, this um, piece is also about a quarter of an inch thick. But those just made some interesting little surface surfaces in the slab with those. And I'm going to go straight up with it, but then I'm going to play with it. Um. Now I'm going to bevel cut this. Score. So I support the outside edge when I'm scoring with my hand. So
I got quiet because everything was trying to fall apart. <laughs> you know, like that. So then I'm, I basically, you can't see this, but I'm going to try, I will try and um, smooth this seam down into the pot. And again, since it's a picture and you'll see the inside, I try and make that as pretty as I can. And a lot of times I get it started, but then I come in and I finish that, that seam later when um, it's had a little more time to, to set up. And this would be pretty much the same type of spout that I would put on this little one. So if you can visualize this on here. But I will play with this a little bit. I want this to go straight. I want this edge to go straight. That is, that's exaggerating that beautiful uplifting line that's happening. And then, yeah. I might do a little bit up in here. Just a subtle, just a subtle. I kind of like it straight. But I do like, you got to have it. You got to put that in there. Oh, yeah, that's nice. And then when I start playing around with the hand carving and stuff, I find a way to, to incorporate, um, to incorporate some of these lines that are in the spout down into the lines that are coming down in here and i I'll play with some of that part of it um, now there the weakest part of this um picture uh at this point that i get i really spent some time on is this joint right here and so what i usually do is come in and add a lip of some sort and so again i will thin out this edge so that i'm not putting a thick having two thick lines i want it to be a thin Thin line I'm going up against. Gina, uh, how many pieces would you work on at once? Just one or? No, that's a, that's a good question because because of the way I work, I will have anywhere from three to five pieces going at the same time. Yeah, that makes sense. And they'll all be at different stages. So mm -hmm. I would have two at this stage like this, and then I would have two where I'm doing all the fine tuning and carving. Depending upon their size, I might only have two in progress. Small ones, at least five. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just because you have to let things sit, set up and um, get strong enough to add the next, the next, uh, to, to do those things we've been those decisions that I still want to make. Right. Okay. So I'm going to add a lip to this and it's usually a simple coil. How much, what time uh, it is? Oh, and we have how much time, Ken? Well, <laughs> we can go right on through because this is very interesting. I think people are enjoying it. I hope so. Um, 
so okay so i'm going to do this it's going to end up looking a lot like this so see how i've added this mm -hmm. but i might not do it that ex that extreme i'm probably gonna Ooh. yeah we have plenty of time gina don't it's it's now here's kind of the fun stuff okay so here's kind of the fun stuff i actually have slabs sitting in my my barrel right next to us from when I was cutting things out and it's like this and I was thinking I'm just going to roll this out and I'm going to I'm going to make a coil and I'm going to flatten it and I'm going to add a little you know when I flatten it I'm going to add like this kind of a you know this kind of a top to it when I flatten it mm -hmm. sort of like like this one but i saw this sitting down here in my bin from the work that we've already done tonight and the reason i loved it almost automatically is that it's going to give me um an asymmetrical top if i use it meaning it's going to be higher on one side than then on the other, which is really nice. It's going to add some life to the form that it wouldn't have had before. Before, if I just did the coil and added it to the top, it would have it would have been all the same the same height. But now, now I add that to there, and now we go. Now we get that nice yeah. variation in size. And I can also play with that a little bit. So I'll do that. I do work on this banding wheel a lot, but when we were setting it up in here, it was too much in the way of, of the demo space. So I did not. Okay. I'm going to clean up that top edge of it on both sides. Now I'm going to change its shape, but I might I might add a line. I'll do it this way. So see that made a nice, a nice line, okay, along the top. And I'm gonna bevel. I'm gonna bevel that, bevel that edge. And this edge, um, I got a moment of, did I do that backwards? <laughs> yeah, I did it backwards for the way I had it on there to begin with, but it works either side I want to put it on. And to mark where that needed to go. I really try and, because uh, clay has gotten so expensive, I really try and keep my bits and pieces uh, on my work table. If I can keep them going, I'll use them for patching. 
I'll use them for the coils just by keeping a spray bottle wet and keep, keep, and I can rework them almost right while I'm, right while I'm working on, on a piece. That makes sense. Okay. Because I wanted to show you, the reason I asked you how late we could go is I wanted to show you one little wheel thrown piece I worked on that I was going to turn into a picture also, but just sort of show you. So that'll be the last thing I'm, I'll do. Oh, you're more than welcome to uh, stick around as long as you like. <laughs> Aren't you getting tired, Ken? Oh, God, no, this is awesome. I love You know, how many times have we watched people work? And I just love it, though. I, I know, I, really I learn do. something every time I watch somebody work. Score and slip, score and slip. <laughs> What uh, clay body are you using? This is, looks like a porcelain. This is um, Kleiber porcelain from Clay Art. I'm not and familiar I with think it. That comes from, it's a Clay Art Center clay. Mm -hmm. And um, I use, for soda firing, I use a lot of B mix. Um, this one, Sometimes I have it written on what letter it is. I'm, I'm, we were given a bunch of, of clay by the Whitworth College that they didn't like for their kids, and it was a Takahara or something like porcelain. And um, I liked it. It was, um, but I have a tendency to use B mix and Kleiber and. Um, Uh, WSO for a sculpture body if I'm doing something really sculptural, which is a brand new piece I've got sitting on the shelf as a wonderful example of the WSO soda fired. Mm -hmm. Can't turn the camera side. So, Stuff like this, rather than try and hide it, I, I really like to, to let some stuff that clay says it's clay, um, I like to worry about it later and heal it from within because that texture is kind of nice with, with the... Um, the rest of the stuff that's going on on the surface. So I will heal that from, I will leave it and then I'll heal it from within. I'll, I'll fill it and um, make sure it's strong later. Later. And again, I'm going to work that whole seam in where I've put them together. I don't know how the tools make it their way from here to here, <laughs> but I don't ever remember using them. <laughs> yeah, they do that. They travel.
Okay. Then the million dollar question is what about the handle? But I'm actually probably not even, I reinforced, so I was worried about reinforcing this joint. And now I get worried about reinforcing this, this joint. So I almost always come in and add um, some sort of support coil along that seam and it can be something. So here I'll use this stuff that I had sitting here. Now it's all workable. I really like that ace. That's kind of fun. I haven't, I, that's, see, that's one of the fun things about demonstrating is having something new happen that you didn't really count on or have never done before. And I don't believe that I have done something that asymmetrical up on top before. I probably have it in a different way. So that's kind of fun for me. I like that. It really is. That low side is a, is a really wonderful profile. You'd be able to it, it just kind of takes you into the interior of the you pot. You just said what I was going to say. You, you get to look into the pot. Yeah, well, it just steers you that way. Yeah. It's a great visual. Uh... And so what I will do on this, um, one of the reasons I like working on the banding wheel is I'm not working the foot of this pot that much like I am right now. One of the things you can do instead of, what I'm doing where I'm just spinning it on this is to put it on a piece of newsprint or something and then you're spinning the newsprint you're not spinning yeah. the clay bottom. The things you think about after you're done demonstrating. <laughs> so I'm gonna just do a little score and slip on both of these these joints just to get them I have multiples of every tool on my tabletop because I'm always looking for one and I, <laughs> I have to find it. So if I have two of them, my job is quicker. <laughs> so I would work I work that coil in so that it is actually really um, integrated into the top and the bottom, in, into the spout there, and into the, the lip, this lip here, outside and in, even though, I'm not going to spend the time and get it all doctored up and pretty right now. But what I've done then is I've added a supporting coil right there. And I can come in and then and I can make it so that it then it looks like that lip, this lip is flowing right into the spout just by doctoring those lines with, with a tool. So I don't know if you can see that, but I added this line and this line, this line, and then no line. So it flows right up into the right up into the spout okay. and I'll do that on both sides just just because then I can doctor them tomorrow get those on there I 
I don't know about everybody else, but I've struggled to work in this pandemic. I get on a roll and I'll work really, really hard and then I lose focus. I mean, and I read a really good book when I was camping and it's been a long time because I lose focus. It's just like, oh, you're tuning into the news and it's just horrible. <laughs> yeah. It's really hard to say, well, what are you working on right now? And I feel like I don't have any magic going on because it's just depressing these days. Well, that this one's going to be kind of fun because instead of it, on this side, it's going to end up being a, come to a little, a nice little triangle instead of the, the division. So yeah, a fun thing happened. Okay. Now the magic question is, so I still haven't decided what I'm going to do with the foot. I think it sits heavy and, and I'm not done with any of the detail work that I would do to make you know, some of these surfaces blend in or not blend in, you know, I might decide to, like this needs paddled much, much more so that it, so that it, you don't really, you don't want to see how you put the slabs, put the slabs to sort of flow into each other without this ridge where you've connected the two seams. Um, which I find very distracting. And um, so I, I tend to do a lot of, of paddling, but I'm trying to get rid of that, that little lump that happens when you connect two seams, which beveling helps stop that from happening. Uh, if I'm gonna have that lump happen, I try and let it happen on the inside of the pot, not the outside of the pot. Um, but now I will come back in on the inside of this since it's a pitcher and I'll really work at those, those joints so that they flow smooth. And, um, and I don't consider myself a functional potter either. <laughs> like, <laughs> if you want to use it, great. But, but I get hung up on all of the stuff that I think is about, is, isn't so much about function, but about, but about what it should be if it was functional, I guess. I don't do you find that those uh, those humps that you're talking about, the ones that you're trying to make disappear where you yeah. make attachments, do you find that they sometimes will disappear but then show up after the firing? Yes. <laughs> yes. So and I will even come in and sand, and I use um, I'll sand before, um, and I'll sand with with this with these. Um, and I'll sand, almost all the pieces will get a good sanding before I throw them into a bisque. Um, and I'll work at those, those seams. Like there's part of me that says that this area here might even just flow and, and disappear. Um, and there's also part of me that thinks that this might be nice if it had a little bit of a, a Thing going on mm -hmm. um, and then the the next question always is is um, a handle so you draw a lot of things that I don't do, do I draw on my pots very much uh, do I draw uh, I don't do a lot of drawing but at this particular case stage I will like take a pencil and I sometimes will draw on my tabletop and um, you know, I'm looking at this form like this and I could do, I could do a really extreme handle like this, or I could go like, like this. And I, I did one or just threw one earlier, just to, or pulled, I pulled a handle. That <laughs> um, and I can play with it a little bit and, and decide You know, do I want it to be, to be long and skinny like that? Do I want it to be like, I don't like that, but I might like it like that. 
do I like it like do I like it like do I like, <laughs> do I like it like that and you know these are kind of the 101 questions because honestly this is kind of fun like that I thought this was I thought this was nice and actually with the handle up high above like I thought that one was nice are there questions <laughs> I was just a comment from a functional standpoint that works better uh, oh, this one yeah. works better functionally yes oh, yeah much much this less leverage. About, this one is all about, and you know me and the work I've done over the years. Oh, yeah. This one is more about line. Oh, yeah. You know, this is more about the whimsy and the line of the piece, uh, not caring whether it's functional. Yes. Um, but this, this is, this is actually quite nice. I think it I is have, very nice. My original, my original vision of it was more like that, but I, this I, to me it's much nicer skinnier yeah um yeah because this is such elongated uh, over here on the spout side yeah. that that kind of reflects the reverse uh form in a negative yeah so that's probably what i would go with on this one and um this top part isn't quite uh, set up enough for me to attach this handle to mm -hmm. it for all of you. So I probably won't do it, but that's the way it would, it would look. And I would probably, okay, so I would probably cut this off um, so that it's, it's an actual, and then I would integrate this top lip into, into that handle let it come up and it wouldn't, it would, it would be a flat, it would be like this and I, and I'd cut the angle and then it would be flat. And then, like that. and then since I've got it and I don't want it to get any wetter or drier, I will store it inside Yes. the perfect damp box for it. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. And, um, so there's that. And then I wanted to show you this little wheel thrown form real quick. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you all should understand, um, how would you deal with the cracks if there is any, and if cra like this crack right here, that's, like I said, in this case, I would leave it. I leave this, this all heal from the inside. I mean, I'm tempted to, I was tempted to even, once I saw the handle on there, I was tempted to, to get rid of that dip, which I can still do. I was tempted to get rid of that dip. <laughs> I still might do that. <laughs> so you have still to this, because it's nighttime, I would cover it completely up with plastic and, um, and then I'll get up in the morning and I will unwrap uh, parts of it, like this area. I'll let it set up and get a little harder so that I can add the handle, the handle to it. Um, but then I'll sort of just watch it to see, um, just watch it to see how it dries. Because um, there's a lot of work that will happen on this when it sets up to not leather hard, for sure, something something um, wetter than that, uh, so that I have the ability to get rid of lines. I have the really the ability to carve into them. I want to doctor the foot a lot, um, but right now it's just it's just needs a little bit more strength or setup so that I can handle it that much. Um, this funny. Um, because I started doing a lot of soda firing and wood firing, my pieces have gotten smaller. So this is, I used to do big, 
big pictures like this, you know, 30, 30 inches. And, uh, but because now I share space with people, you know, this, this is a pretty, a pretty big, pretty big for me, right in this range. And I don't think it has as much to do with my not having the strength to do the big pieces. I think it has to do with the fact that I'm sharing kiln space now, uh, doing the soda firings um, that I wasn't doing before. So, um, set this one aside and show you this little wheel thrown one. So I do a lot of wheel thrown forms anymore that, um, because it's quicker than the slab. And I, um, but Gina, it's not round. And I <laughs> do them without a bottom. I, I've never really liked round forms. Never have I, I, and I know, Ken, you use a round form and you make them elegant and they're just freaking beautiful. And I cannot make a round form that does not look stiff. Uh, I, it's just not a form I can work with. It's an eye hand thing we all have. That's, we're all, you know, as artists, we're all unique that way. And I have always been more, maybe it's my years of, you know, drawing where I see this as a surface and this is a surface and I see the silhouette and I don't know. I just, um, so I, I work on this pretty much the same ways I'm, I'm working with this one. Okay. So they're an oval. Um, this is wheel thrown. This was slab thrown. This is, um, I s already cleaned. This is how it came off the wheel like this. So I'll come in and um, and clean up this bottom. So it's nice and pretty because you're gonna be able to see it. And then just like this one, I'm gonna roll out a slab and I'm gonna, I'm gonna score and slip the slab and attach it to the bottom. Uh, this one I might do a straight cut on the slab um, instead of the bevel. Score it and slip and make a nice clean cut. I still will do quite a bit of this to that to that slab when I get it on there. Quite a bit of this, uh, and then I'll coil it from the inside uh, because I can reach. And, um, and you can see it. And then you can see that um, I already started on this one before you got, before we did this, did the thing where I push out and, and then push back in. And so I'll usually, I'll take these and do a drawing on them. Um, and then, I do a lot of, um, leaf patterns, nothing very uh, original. Um, They're very beautiful. I'm drinking out of I, one of your cups this oh, evening. I do. Uh, are you drinking something good? <laughs> it's good to me. Okay. Uh, and so then I drew, did the drawing and then I come in from the inside and I I push out the forms. <laughs> and then I come in and um, I carve away with my favorite tool that walked away. Okay. Come in and I carve the image out <coughs> and then sometimes I will use this which is got a little tiny bevel on it and I will I can don't have to carve the whole thing out I can
I can sort of smooth it out. And I will do that whole drawing much like what I have done here, okay, on this side. And then um, in a case like this, because I'm pushing out and it doesn't show a crack on the inside, so when I'm doing these carvings, a lot of times I'll, I'll heal a crack like this because this work, this piece, the crack looks like a crack. Whereas on the piece I was working on before, the crack feels like the texture that we're working on. It's part of the whole, the whole feel. So on, a, on something like this, I'll come in and I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll work that crack um, so that it, it doesn't want to open up. Sometimes you have to score it and um, add a little a little slurry to it and then work it work that crack back but this side didn't have any cracks because I did this one it was much softer on this side and then and then um, again I would this one could possibly have a little different response, I'll show you a finished one that's like this, and that'll be quicker, and then we can answer questions. I'm out of the picture for a minute. This one has a little different slab bottom on it too, but I'm actually looking forward to finishing this one. Good. That one a lot, I really like that. Okay, so this one's a lot like, this one's a lot like this one. Um, the, the bird beak isn't as dramatic. Um, it's more functional. Uh, this size of picture, I tend to try and make more functional. It does help pay for my clay. <laughs> People <laughs> buy smaller pictures. The foot on this is fun, but it has a tendency to to get a little, uh, little, a little walk rock. Right? Yeah. I to love rock. it. It's a really beautiful. But I, I love it. And yeah. so I continue doing it. Um, and I just tell them, well, it's just rocks. <laughs> <laughs> I just like the way it looks, which again goes back to me not being a functional potter per se and doing things because I like the line it makes and the whimsy it creates. And um, so uh, I probably would finish this, this piece here a lot like this one. One of the things though that I'm not happy with is that if I put the spout on this side, which is the way this one wants, this is for some reason, this is the shape wants me to put the spout on this side. And, the handle here, my I would have actually have liked to have had the flow of my drawing go the opposite direction. Um, I would have liked to have had it come this way instead of this way. I, it's just a anybody can question me on that one. <laughs> I'm a bit confused how you want to attach the handle to the picture on the top frame when you lay it on top and then add coils to blend it in. Oh. I will lay it, I will, on that, to add that handle to the top, I will score that top lip really well when it has had time to set up. And then I score the handle really, really well. And then I will add coil, hard and heavy around those seams, and then redefine the line so that, that it is, so that it doesn't thicken that connection, but it, but it, um, I just add a, uh, a line. It's, um, I will do, once it's set up, that, that thing is going to look like, it's going to look like this. It's going to match the contour of the lip, but it's going to be well reinforced with a coil on all of the seams. And then I will come in and 
kind of, even if I have to just doctor in the lines so that the, the line of where the handle attaches is still separate and, and evident instead of, I think, I might, it might end up flowing into that top line. Um, I can send um, Ken a pic of it when I'm done attaching it because that is probably one of the more complicated parts of that picture probably yeah. yeah that i would play with so but ken do you understand where i was thinking that i'd like the the lines of this to go I, the opposite direction? yeah i think i understand but a lot of times those those are decisions that you think you're going to go one way and mm -hmm. then the piece says no yeah no, this is what i need and mm -hmm. you kind of have to uh you have, you to, have to let the shape in the pot they, they talk to you absolutely you gotta you gotta be open to letting them talk to you and um and make make those decisions now there's stuff i could do to make that work too in the design so which would happen later but this is how i start a lot of my pieces instead of the slab form but i'm really glad i did that one a lot <laughs> <laughs> that was really a happy, a happy, right. a happy happening right there. But um, this, if I were to say I do a production line of pictures, this is how I begin them. Yeah, for um, for the kiln fire. Yeah. Okay. So. Hey, can we all go back on uh, on camera and? Uh, Yay. Let's see. Hopefully we won't lose you right away. So I uh, just want to say thank you so much. This has really been a wonderful evening with you. Um, I'm going to celebrate with my little cup. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you get that one? I think we traded or I bought it. I can't remember. Oh. I, it was at Bellevue Fair, I'm sure. Oh, be danged. Many years okay. ago. <laughs> yeah. So, cheers. Always, my cups are always a handful. That's for sure. <laughs> I have big hands and <laughs> they're always big. Oh, it's a wonderful cup. I love it. I got one a lot like it right here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I... I had no idea the way you applied that, and uh, it was very interesting to see. Oh, I the, thought the, I thought you were, well, yeah, I thought you were like using a mold and pressing in uh -huh. the interior oh. into the mold. Um, <laughs> Repose. I think awesome. that's how you say that word, but yeah, yeah. Uh, totally press out, and uh, I do the pressing out early. Sometimes, like if I do a series of those cups, I'll throw like six of them and then I'll sit there after I've got them trimmed and they're still really soft. I will literally press, get all the basic, I'll do a quick little line drawing on them and then I'll do a real basic pressing out and then I let them stiffen up and I come back in and, and do uh, the carving. So a personal story on this, not to get too sappy, but um, Ken's had a journey, I have had a journey, and uh, there was a lot, uh, quite a long period in my time where, in, where I only had like an hour in the studio. Oh. And, I, and I had to find something that I could do. And I'd never ever in my life treated my play as therapy. And, and all of a sudden I thought, well, I can make some of these little cup forms and I can you know, storm in the thing and I can come in and spend an hour and carve them and, and be done. And then all of a sudden that hour helped me forget a lot of the stuff that was going on in my life. And yeah. I, I just, it to totally redirected the way I was approaching my play. So this was about 10, 10 years ago. I wasn't doing any of this hand carving 10 years ago. And, um, and it was just, it's just been a really wonderful journey. 
the hand carving part. It's very, and it is, it's therapeutic. You lose your, you lose your uh, self in it and you forget uh, everything that's else that's going on. Yeah, so those, those are the end result of, of that period of life. <laughs> I'm, on a, I'm in a good period of life now, and we're hoping everybody else is, too. That's so awesome. Yeah. So and can you unlock it. my video? Um, I can't unlock anyone's video. Okay. Are you able to unlock your own? No, it says that it's the videos. It can't start because the host has stopped it. Oh. Um, <laughs> Ray. I cannot uh, start my video either. I Ray, think are you Ray, here? Ray probably stopped it. Ray did. Ray leave. Something. Hi, Jen. Yeah, can you? Uh, let me see here. And you have to teach me that trick. <laughs> So, oh. because Rayanne and Kathy it, and I it, and uh, Susan. How's that? There we go. She's back. Definitely. Yes. Okay. Oh, you know, you have one of your huge hanging planters. Yes, you did. The wire loop. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, fun. I haven't made those in a while. Yeah, yeah. They were oval, so it was tough to put stuff in them. Yeah, this one goes down in the cone. Oh, okay. But the top is oval, right? Yes. Yeah. You made it hard to plant, but I liked it oval versus circular. Yeah. <laughs> So were there any questions? Probably many, many. Yeah. I think Kathy has some. I have a question. Thank you, Gina, for your demonstration. It was beautiful. Um, I'm new to clay and clay processes, and I was, I guess, the part that I didn't understand about the soda firing is, do you get all of the, the tones, your copper and green, just from the soda firing and not from any type of glaze? or? Uh, there's very little glaze on this. Um, the black is a stain, just a cone 06 um, underglaze. And the, um, this blush comes from um, the soda not hitting this clay body as heavily as here, as it did here. Because the soda will make some, a lot of times will make things go whiter because of the coating. So the clay body, the color comes from clay body and from atmosphere and from some stains and flashing. So there's some flashing slips that you can use. I probably use a little bit of flashing slip on this, which is like an, um, an uh, uh, on go, I don't know, those are kind of complex, but the colors basically come are limited in the soda fire. Gina? Yeah, if I iron base, yes. Since since you're sharing the kiln with other potters, yes. um, perhaps they're using something that could possibly mm. flash to your work as well? Yes. Um, I share my kiln with uh, my gallery mates that I help run a little gallery with, and um, one of them, Mark Moreland. Trackside Gallery. Yes. You can do a plug. Uh, Mark Mark likes to use a lot of commercial cone tan glazes in in fire because he was given them. And without fail, they almost always have copper rim and yeah. um, cobalt. And they, those will flash on a pot badly next to it. And... So I, be, I told Mark his go on one shelf <laughs> and, not, and not, they don't go next to mine. I did a whole bunch of glaze tests and didn't really realize how bad his were going to flash and lost most of whatever I was going to learn from, from putting those glaze tests in. But, but um, I use porcelains on these so 
my tones tend to be more more ivory toned mm -hmm. whereas um this is a piece i don't know if i can bring it over i would love to bring it over um this is a brand new piece this is uh i'll probably regret it but This is a WSO, uh, so a sculpture by High Iron Based, brand new piece. Oh, wow. Wow. And um, this is soda fire. This is soda fire. The, and you can tell up here it went wider because the soda hit it really heavy. Mm. But um, the rest of it's a real high iron based clay and it, um, it, it goes, you get the really beautiful brown, brown tones That's gorgeous. with the iron based clay. It's gorgeous. Are yeah, you? This one, <laughs> I have the idea and I didn't know if it would, how it would turn out with the basket form. I did two different vases to go in it and this vase worked and the other one looked horrible. <laughs> So I was glad I did two of them. So, yeah, this is. But that shows you the difference. The difference clay can make in a in a mm. fabric, just the clay bond. So. so why is it then that um, how does porcelain? How is it harder to work with for beginners versus like a, the clay that we're working with? I guess this question. For Ken and Gina. Well, uh, you have to stay with the porcelain. It uh, it can it dries out a little quicker than you expect it to, and and then it loses its um, plasticity. I see. You can't do anything with it. So I think that's why I have a tendency and have learned to work with porcelain with it very soft and and uh, flexible, wet, um, and um, and then let it set up and get, have more strength. Uh, I love, I love the way porcelain throws, um, but I, I'm not using, I'm not using really a true porcelain either. I'm not using like a, a really fine porcelain. These, there's some really nice porcelains out there that have a lot of, that have nice workability to them. I, I wouldn't call them, um, I don't know if they're trade off between workability and translucency. Mm -hmm. and yeah, you lose the translucency when you start going to a porcelain that's been modified with maybe, I don't know if they add some stoneware to it of some sort, or I don't know what they do to it. I just like the name, so I buy Clyber and it worked. <laughs> I loved it. And, um, and I do love, I, everybody says they don't like a bee mix because it's slimy or something, but I, I really love working with bee mix. You know, I, I hated it when I first started, but everybody wanted to use it. And, and uh, it just, it generates a lot of slip. Um, it does, it does, which is that slimy factor. In yeah, it. it just generates a lot of slip. Oh, but it is a fabulous yeah. clay body. It will do just about anything, and yeah. it's very forgiving. And I actually bought some OH from Clay Art in Tacoma because they said it was their version of B-Mix. Yeah, no. Nah. And um, this is OH. The base is OH. And um, it... It wasn't as plastic anywhere near as plastic, and it has a little bit of a grain to it that I wasn't um, mm -hmm. real keen on because uh, I have a tendency to do a lot of scrubbing, and so then whatever the the sand or that they put into it came to the surface. To the surface, I had, sure. I had to work it work it back in to it, but um, uh, it's beautiful. Is the vase completely hand built? The vase is wheel thrown um, to about here, about three quarters of the way up, in an oval, new bottom put on it, and uh, and then the rest just just added, yeah. Wow. Oh. So. so those textures on top were not pushed out from inside. It looks were they? 
patch um, on top of the the outside of the vase uh, out where here. they pushed where they pushed out um, yep. from inside like you wow mm -hmm. this petal right here um, I uh, added that top petal but the rest of these are were all pushed out wow and carved in it's amazing effect mm -hmm. Lots to uh, lots to think about, huh? Get your uh, get your motor running. Well, it's a fun process. I've seen it done a lot of ways. I've seen it uh, where you do what you were saying. You push it up against a surface and push into it, um, and get your your texture. But I lose my ability to kind of draw that way. Yeah. So. Um, um, I had a good friend, I, I'm an Eastern Washington person, so you might not know who he is, but his name was Harold Blaze. Oh, yeah. And uh, he Absolutely. and I, he's passed away now, but he uh, looked at me about, I don't know, 15 years ago. We came, he drove me over to Seattle to go see a show at the Fry Art Museum, and he looked at me and he says, when are you going to start drawing on your pots? <laughs> Because <laughs> I just always had relied on texture. At that time, I was doing all mm. the simple rolled-in textures and and um, then hand-coloring them all different colors. And hadn't started doing any of the soda fired or wood firing yet. And and uh, it just was in the back of my brain. He just kept saying it. I loved the man so much, and I just went, "Okay, I'm gonna jump in." You know, we all go through stages in our our work where our work where just something happens and it sends us on a path and, and it's rejuvenating, mm -hmm. you know? And um, I, I probably, my work has changed probably, I don't know, four or five major times. I mean, you can see sort of the flow from one stage to the next, but, but there's, but they've, they've been different. The, the first few years is dramatically because I was making a lot of work to sell to to buy my wheels and to buy my kilns and I was making a lot of very cute pretty stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> that sold really well yeah. <laughs> so and then I decided I'd rather teach than make that kind of work so I could do what I wanted to do instead you know do the kind of work that I wanted to do right instead of that work to to sell to lots of selling yeah yeah, yeah. So. i understand that completely yeah. the years of uh, christmas of sitting and making masses of christmas bells with everybody's kids names on them <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> oh boy I guess I never did yeah, that. You but. never did that. Mm -hmm. uh, did that paid for an electric kill. Right. <laughs> gotta do what you gotta do. You gotta do. I know people that knew that work back then, and they went, "Ah, oh, she'll never sell another thing again." When I quit. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> so. All right. Does anyone uh, have any other questions for Gina regarding her work or? So everybody's working at home. Yeah. And building. Yeah. So how <clears throat> I have a question. Okay. So how many years it take you to be that good? <laughs> oh gosh, you know, we're all still learning. <laughs> oh. I just finished a series of work and I created a slab a certain way because I liked the edge it made. Mm -hmm. And every single one of those slabs cracked and split and pancakes separated wow. and god they're beautiful pieces and i pretty much lost them all <laughs> so i mean it's i think clay is one of the longest learning curves of the arts and uh you're always learning something new and you know i've been doing this like since 1974 Oh, yeah. yeah. Long time. Steady, full time. Wow. Mm -hmm. 
Wow. <laughs> we have a long way to go. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and it pulls you in and it keeps you and I've never wanted to do anything else. So that's go. great. Yeah. Ken knows. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. All right, and, and guys, those pieces you've been doing with the color first and then the then the crackle over the top, those are just uh, luscious. Look. Well, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do any of that if I hadn't started teaching either. I know. I mean, teaching you know, this up. It, it really allows you to experiment mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and, you know, this medium that we're, that we're using, there's no limit to what you can do with it. It's just, it's, it's a challenge every day to come in and uh, not do, so, you know, I mean, I spent many, many years as a production potter or studio potter. Mm -hmm. I and mean, I didn't do the same pots for, you know, that I started doing 30 years ago or 40 years ago. I'm not doing those same pots today, but I did them. I did do repetition for a lot of years and even though things change the change was slow and gradual and i did what i had to do to to sell the work but also had to do to please myself mm -hmm. um but being in a a situation where um i'm no longer uh reliant on the income from the pots i have the ability to do what Just i want right. and and you know it took me a while to realize that <laughs> it took me actually quite a while to realize that um but it is it is a gift to be able to just be creative and not have to worry about am i going to be able to pay my mortgage um or car payment or you know buy my kids shoes or well yeah we always want to keep we want to keep our pottery honest i mean it, it has to support itself you know yeah. so i i have never ever my clay buys my pot buys the clay mm. and it pays for the firing i've never never in my life ever in a budget was the clay coming out of our grocery budget or <laughs> you know so that's what teaching freed me up to be able to um to to do more with the sale of you know the money that did come out of it i could i could use it more creatively um uh i i you have to like teaching and you have to be good at it, but the teaching is a gift if you can manage that. And it was for me, and it sounds like it was for you too. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, I tell people all the time, I had never had any intention of being a teacher and it just kind of fell, fell upon me yeah. and I enjoyed it. It's so wonderful to be able to share something that you're passionate about with others who who want to learn you know what you have to offer so it's it is a gift yeah. um so i gotta say it's a i lead a blessed life so. well you know this pandemic that we're in the middle of and a lot of selfish people who <laughs> are going to be really upset about having to wear a mask i i <laughs> Stay in your studio and work, and then you don't have to wear a mask. I've been the to be an artist has just been a blessing during this whole thing because yeah. I'm not bored. I'm have, always have something to do. I mean, I can garden. I love to garden, um, but um, it's just uh, to be able to have this thing that we can go and do is. It's like my life really didn't change when the pandemic. I just have to go wear a mask when I go to the grocery store. Yeah. Well, yeah. So. I was going to write uh, poll questions, but it wouldn't allow me to do that 
tonight because I was apparently logged on to, uh, you know, two computers or something. It wouldn't allow me. But one of my poll questions was going to be, during this time of the pandemic, do you feel like uh, you have more time, less time, or the same amount of time? And for me, I feel like I don't have nearly enough time. I feel like I'm just constantly have things to do. So it's not... It's I, not feel, just... I feel like I have, strangely enough, I feel like I have less time also. And, and I, but I think it's because we're so distracted by the, all the stuff that's going on. Yeah. I don't know why, because I'm probably spending the same amount of time in my studio, but I am, like I think I mentioned it before, I'm not as focused as I wish I was. You know, it's like someone said, well, because I just finished a body of work, so now I'm ready to go back and start another body of work, and, and I don't really have a great idea. I don't have that one piece in my brain that I've been developing at three o'clock in the morning that I want to begin the body of work with. And I just can't seem to get my brain wrapped around it. And I think it's because there's so much. I need to probably just shut off the TV. What's well, this asymmetrical rim has got you on a, the a new role. The asymmetrical rim might just do it. <laughs> You might just do it. Okay. Uh, that's kind of a fun, a fun top. Yeah, maybe that's. Yeah. All yeah. right. So. Well, listen, Gina. Um, this was really, really wonderful. Invite I, me back, and I'll do teapots. I would <laughs> love to. Definitely love to have I'm you back. I'm so tickled to be invited. In the East Side, we get forgotten over here. <laughs> We have all these events over in the Seattle area, you know, for Washington Clay Arts and all that. I never get to go to them. <laughs> I could go to them if I made the time. But, Tina, know, I have it's... a question. Oh, I have a question. Okay, I'm looking ahead. at your kiln in, the, in your background. I would love to, are you able to show us what it looks like a little bit more? Uh, right. I I think I, <laughs> I think I can move the laptop and show you. We'll see how that works. I don't know. Um, it is, uh, we, this is Small World. I don't know how many of you know Reed Ozaki and um, Rick Mahaffey. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, East Side Potters. Yes. <laughs> they were production potters and they, um, oh, this will work. Okay. They, uh, lost their lease in their studio and they had to tear their kiln down and they on washington clay arts i don't know how far I think it is. on washington clay arts they they had to tear their kiln down and they put this up for sale and i contacted them and i bought it and it was all in pieces and at that time it was a car kiln so the floor of the kiln came uh hard to tell the floor of the kiln came out rolled into my studio <laughs> it's hard to tell and the um so now when i started doing with soda firing i got rid of the car kiln part and i i stoke wood on each side of the kiln here and there and for the last three hours and that's where I put the soda in and here's the here's the bamboo things I was talking about right here that we put the whoop, we put the soda in these and then we take these and we slide them through those holes down there whoop, down there and then dump them out but this uh is it's had a journey because that was probably 19 i don't know 1990 that it came over here from rick and tom tom uh rick and uh rick reed. and reed and 
then I rebuilt it and then I rebuilt it again and uh, it probably is going to need a new arch. I don't know. See, there's nice, mm. nice stuff going on. I just had someone come in and we did some more iron reinforcing. Um, but it's had a long journey and it's fired a lot of pots and it's not meant to be a soda kiln, but it's, I have two electric kilns out here. Two. I just found this one at an auction house, this nice little electric kiln right there. Found that one. It's fun watching it spin around. Found that one. And this one right here I've had since 1974. Ah. <laughs> that's the Looks one like I bought with show. all of the that's the one I bought with all the Christmas stuff. Uh, bells with kids <laughs> All right. names on them that one that old olympic so that's a gas fired kiln that you're stoking wood into i um the propane or <laughs> there I am. so it's gas and then um i fire it with gas all the way until i hit cone uh one and then i would st I, I keep the gas on the whole firing and then I stoke wood for about three hours. And then I bring it up to temp to cone nine. And then um, start stoke. We do um, three, three stokes of soda on each side of the kiln. So three and three. And we stoke wood at the same time. So we put the stoke the wood in then throw the soda on top. And then uh, once that's done, then we bring it up to the temp we want it to shut down. And then I do a, about a four or five hour reduction cool. Oh, wow. Um, so it, we, we start usually on a Friday morning, load it, and then I candle it Friday night, start getting it all up to temp all day Saturday, and then around seven o'clock at night, I start doing the wood and then the soda and then sometime around one in the morning and we start the reduction cool. The nice thing about doing it all at night is the neighbors don't see all the smoke. <laughs> <laughs> My neighbors do, don't mind. So I have potters in the neighborhood and, and, uh, it's amazing. Nobody really comes over and even asks me what I'm doing. I, I've never understood that. Can you be curious? I'd be curious. Yeah. <laughs> You'd be so freaking curious. What are they doing over there? That crazy lady oh, over God. there playing with fire they again. Come and ask me what I'm doing. Someone called one of the first times and they said, your house is on fire. <laughs> okay. But it's, it's interesting, but it's a life uh, lifestyle. Is the kiln, is the brick mortar together or just stacked? Oh, stacked. Well, I used, I used a very, very loose set, a very thin, thin, sticky, just, but really thin. Um, you need the kiln to be able to breathe. Uh, to, it has to expand and contract in the firing. So you can't, they, the, one of the things that made me comfortable about rebuilding it, I'd never built a kiln before was, Someone said to me that, or I read it somewhere, is that a bricklayer would build a horrible, a brick mason, <laughs> would build a horrible kiln because they would do it, make it too tight. And um, I think, remember my husband coming out and asking me, do you know what you're doing? And I said, no, I have no idea what I'm doing. I, I'm following the pictures. Because <laughs> they've taken pictures as they tore it down. They took pictures of every stage and then I just you know I didn't even know that you shouldn't put soft brick on the inside I, I didn't know anything so and it's just hung in there for me <laughs> I did not know anything that the opening here gets bricked up um that stack of brick that's over here on the left is the door so 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 when you're loading the kiln you add shelves and stuff as you're going along is yeah yeah, so this kiln gets three ranks of shelves, um, so it's three deep um, from floor up, and uh, it holds a lot of pots. I, Rick and um, Reed, they were 
doing a lot of production work. Then they were filling that thing once a month. Um, and uh, so I'm, <laughs> my, my daughter just went, you, oh, the, the laptop has moved. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty proud of that kiln. That's great. Yeah. I had to, I tore my, uh, this little studio I'm in is, is uh, about a 10 by 12 foot studio. And I uh, used to have the whole building it's in, it used to be all studio. And about um, five years ago, I decided to tear, to tear it down and rebuild it so I could live in it and work in it. And uh, I, the workmen knew that if they did anything, then most of them <laughs> didn't even know what it was. I caught one guy standing on top of it so that he could do the, the beam. Oh. I mean, Ooh. they did not, and I had like, you touched that, you read, <laughs> just thought it looked like, they didn't know what it was. And it was just like my most prized possession. My most prized possession, my kiln and a nice big red wheelbarrow. <laughs> I love <laughs> <laughs> so uh, awesome okay. okay all right well listen i miss seeing ken so this is great <laughs> it's been great it really thank has thank you so much thank you yeah. thank you thank you and good luck in your journey with clay because it's <laughs> you'll never it goes on <laughs> yes it forever does. here's to you gina Thank you, Ken. <laughs>